it is a pleasure for me to be delivering this talk uh, in this uh, real webinar, PDE webinar. Um, and uh, I will be delivering this talk on regularity theory for nonlinear diffusion processes. This is the summary of my talk. I will discuss a little bit about the general idea of diffusion. And then I will describe what happens when you are in composed materials. And then I will discuss uh, a little bit about nonlinear diffusion. Next, I will talk about free boundary problems. And uh, finally, I will discuss this uh, general idea of non-physical free boundaries and how those ideas can be applied to prove a regularity results for, uh, for diffusion equations. Okay, so diffusion 101. Here's the general question that starts um, uh, the talk. Given a function h of x such that at each point y in its domain, the value of h at y equals the average of h itself on a ball centered at y. So if you are trying to find this function and you write things down in a slightly more precise mathematical terms, you end up with this equation. Uh, y, that's precisely what is written in the equation, uh, in the question, and, and the equation becomes this. And the answer to that question, everybody should know by now, is that uh, this function h verifies this homogeneous balancing condition if and only if the function is harmonic in the sense that it, it satisfies the Laplacian of u equals zero. And then you see uh, there is something that happens, this connection between uh, being equal to its average and being harmonic, there is a gap on regularity. And let me explain this. So, so if you see the equation on the top makes sense for, let's say, continuous functions. But down here, solutions are C2. And as, as a matter of fact, once they are harmonic in C2, they become real analytic. So there is a magic that happens in terms of the smoothness of the solution on these uh, blue implication uh, uh, between these two, these two equations. And understanding this magic is really the, the soul of uh, regularity theory. Somehow, this balancing condition, which is a, a per se a diffusion <clears throat> property, uh, bears some regularity uh, effect on the function that satisfies the equation. So in theater regularity theory, it, it has the universal format of you have a function that satisfies some PDE, let's say in the unit ball of RD, then you control a a functional norm of u by another norm of u, uh, a weaker norm of u, and somehow uh, f and e are functional spaces and f is compact, compactly embedded in, in u. So once I write an interior regularity to result like this, I'm putting together like a Hilbert estimates, C1 alpha estimates, a Sobol F type of estimates and, and all of them. They all have this universal format. And the key point is that uh, the constant that appears there, it may depend on several parameters, and in most of the case, they depend on dimension, depend on, on, on lipticity and many things, but it, it, it doesn't depend on you itself. So it's a universal in that, in that sense, is that uh, the constant does not depend on the solution itself. For all, all, all possible solutions of that ODE, or, or I'm sorry, that PDE, the solution, um, the, the, the equi this inequality holds with the same constant. Okay, so let now let me describe what happens in composed materials. Um, so if you it, remember the, the initial question that I posed 
asks for a function that uh, equals its average in every point, and this average is perfectly symmetric. So the, the, this uh, perfect symmetry of the ball translates into a very pure uh, medium in which the diffusion happens. And that's why we get the Laplacian, which is a homogeneous uh, um, rotational invariant operator. If you have a heterogeneous medium where you may have preferable directions, you end up with similar operators in divergence and in no divergence form, where, but you have coefficients. And uh, the, this model is really uh, conveying a diffusion process if these uh, ellipses, elliptic functions are ellipt I'm sorry, these matrices that represents the uh, properties of the medium are elliptic in the sense that it's symmetric and uh, the eigenvalues are bounded above and below. So as long as you have this, you are really modeling a, a diffusion process in the sense that we, we described before. Okay, so what can we say when the coefficients are not constant? Well, the first major result is, is due to Schalder, and it's called Schalder regularity theory, and goes back to the 1930s, is that if the medium, meaning the coefficients aij, are held or continuous, then a solution to a non-variational problem, aij of x dij of u equals zero, are C2 gamma. And here you notice that this gamma is the same gamma as the coefficients. And in the variational problem, a divergence of Aij gradient of u equals zero implies that the solution is C1 gamma. And again, the gamma is the same. Uh, what I'd like to point out is that this theorem is sharp in the sense that you cannot improve this gamma and highly non-trivial. And to explain why this result is non-trivial, let me uh, show you a particular case of this theorem. It has to do with the Poisson equation. So imagine that you have the simplest case possible is that you have an, a function u that satisfies Laplacian of u equals a function f. And this function f, the potential is Hilder continuous, is C0 gamma for some gamma. So Schauder theory implies that U is C2 gamma. <clears throat> so a way to appreciate this result is like this. Look at the Haitian of the function U. So what Schauder tells us is that if the trace of this matrix, meaning the sum of the uh, diagonal entrances of this matrix, u11, u22, u33, if the sum is held or continuous, c0 gamma, then all entrances in the matrix, all entrances in the matrix are necessarily c0 gamma for the same constant gamma. And this is remarkable because uh, most of the entrances here don't even appear in the equation. So for instance, u12 is not related in the equation and somehow because of this magic uh, combination of the sum of the diagonal happens to be C0 gamma, then this implies uh, regularity, the same kind of regularity for all entrances of the matrix. Okay, so that's for continuous coefficients. What happens if uh, the coefficients are not continuous? And let me explain this in a in homogeneous medium, in a very uh, cartoon-like example. Imagine that you have a medium made of iron and gold. And the, the question, and then I have some temperature distribution in these, uh, in this metal, and you ask if the temperature, what's the behavior of the temperature when it jumps from one side to another? In other words, if you go 
and you measure the temperature in one side of the metal and another side of the, the metal, uh, if the, the very close to the junction, whether these uh, values will be close. In other words, I'm asking if uh, the temperature uh, flows in a continuous fashion from one side to another. And this is a very, uh, I mean, it's a very simple question. I can place this question. I can explain this to my uh, six-year-old son and he will understand the problem. Uh, but the problem is, is, from the mathematical perspective, is very deep and uh, it's deep because the temperature still will uh, follow an elliptic equation, which is a very simple elliptic equation, but the coefficients are now discontinuous. It could be constant in one uh, part of the, uh, of the metal and, a, and another, a different constant in another part. So there is a jump. And because of that, uh, the shoulder estimates cannot be applied. Surprisingly enough, uh, this naive looking problem is as hard to be solved as Hubert's 19th problem. And this has been known for a long time that uh, uh, the uh, Hubert's 19th problem has a PDE approach, which boils down to proving that solutions to that kind of equation are, uh, are continuous. So this, the fundamental question is this, uh, do solutions to elliptic equation uh, elliptic equations share a universal modus of continuity. In other words, if I fix the ellipticity and only the ellipticity and of course dimension, whether solutions will have a universal modulus of continuity. So that's the question. Um, I want to know if I have if I if I have both in divergence and non divergence form. <clears throat> and um, and this is true. The first result goes back to the George Nash and Moser, and it starts to be proven in, in the 50s. It is known, uh, known as the George Nash Moser regularity theory. And uh, nearly two, 20 years later, uh, Krilov and Safanov proved the same result for non divergence form equations. So, yes, it, it is true. So, answering the naive looking question, the temperature will uh, flow in a continuous fashion from one side to another. And that solves, this is how D. George solved uh, Hubert's 19th problem. Okay, now let me <clears throat> mention about nonlinear diffusion. Because um, by now, all the equations that I presented to you, even though the coefficients are discontinuous, they are linear in the sense that the equation that appears is, are linear. But I would like to convey that uh, the George Nash Moser and uh, Krilov Safan of regularity theory, they actually pertain to the nonlinear theory of diffusion. And, <clears throat> and um, a major consequence of those two major theorems are that if you have a function that satisfies a fully nonlinear equation, a completely nonlinear equation, as long as the equation is elliptic in the sense that this capital F that acts on the matrix is Lipschitz and, uh, and, and increasing in, in, in the particular sense, uh, or if you are in divergence form equation and you have a solution of the Pilaplacian, then solution, solutions to those equations are in fact C1 alpha. Mm, and, uh, and, and, and what I'm trying to say is that even though those are results, are sophisticated results that belongs to the nonlinear theory of, uh, of diffusion, they actually are consequences of uh, the George. I'm not saying they are trivial consequences, but they follow by, by, by the results of uh, the George Nash Moser and uh, Krilov Safanov. Krilov Safanov opens up the possibility of studying fully nonlinear equations, and the George Nash Moser uh, 
somehow uh, create this very powerful nonlinear potential theory that nowadays uh, are, are, are such a popular subject of research. <clears throat> um, so what I'd like to point out is that even though we know that solutions are C1 alpha in both cases, uh, because of the way that those results are obtained, you quite don't, don't know uh, what kind of, of estimates are given in the sense that you don't know how uh, this alpha, which is a universal number, depend on dimension and ellipticity constants and or P depending on which problem you're studying. And this is a major problem that has many other consequences is to understand how well the, diff the nonlinear diffusions behave in terms of the regular estimates that are available for, for solutions to that problem. Um, and these kind of problems are, uh, are very uh, well understood in the context of free boundaries. So let me explain what, what are free boundaries uh, Let me try to explain what free boundaries are and what is the connection between free boundaries and these problems that I just presented. So obstacle problem, let me explain uh, the obstacle problem, which is a, one of the simplest problems to uh, free boundary kind of problems to understand because I think everybody has an intuition about this problem. Uh, the problem is to find an equilibrium position of, of an elastic membrane attached to an a wire that is constrained to lay above a given obstacle. So the picture you should have in mind is, is this. And um, so it's, 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 it's not hard to see that um, the, the function U, the solution to the obstacle problem, it does verify a PDE, but it only verifies a PDE in this, in a set that depends on you itself. Namely, it's only when you is above the obstacle that uh, the function satisfies the PD. So the picture of the obstacle problem goes like this. You have a, an obstacle, you have the non coincident set, in other words, the set where the membrane is above the obstacle. In that set, the function is harmonic, let's say, and you have the coincident set, the set where U is, is tied to the obstacle. Um, so from the functional analysis perspective, this problem is not much harder than, than the, the, the simplest membrane problem without the constraint of laying above, above an obstacle. So it's easy to prove existence and uniqueness of a solution prescribed the, the wiring, in other words, prescribed the boundary condition. Um, it's also not hard to verify that U has this concave-like shape. In other words, the Laplacian of U is always greater, is, is always less than or equal to zero. And in fact, it satisfies the PE in the set where U is above the obstacle. And here's the one key uh, result is that you are locally of class C11 and this regularity is optimal. So even though solutions to, to the Laplace equation, Laplacian of U equals zero is real analytic, uh, solutions to the obstacle problem are only C11. And that happens because I have a free boundary. I have a region where the PDE verif is verified and there is a region that I don't have a PDE. Uh, the, uh, the function only agrees with the obstacle. And uh, in fact, uh, in, a, in, this, in his famous paper, 19, 1977 paper of Luis Caffarelli, he proves that uh, the, the free boundary itself is a smooth surface provided the contact set is thick enough. And I don't wanna enter into the technicalities of this result, but it's a major result that opens up uh, a, a whole school of, of, uh, <clears throat> of studying free boundary regularity uh, theory. Here's another obstacle 
Uh, I'm sorry. Here's another uh, free boundary problem, which is a very important problem. It has to do with cavitation. So the picture that I want you to have in mind is this one. Uh, you have a function which is non-negative, and uh, and it vanishes somewhere. And what you want to do is you want the function to be harmonic in the region where u is positive, so in other words, greater than zero. And you also want to prescribe uh, the angle in which this function vanishes. So mathematically, what you want is this. You want the function to be harmonic in the set of positivity. Uh, U will vanish in a, some unknown region. But let's say that you want uh, the function to vanish in such a way that the, the normal derivative is one along this unknown region because the, the set where U is positive is unknown, therefore, the boundary of this set is also unknown. But if you apply divergence theorem, you can uh, remove this condition and replace to one which is slightly simpler to, or uh, for the mathematical treatment, is saying that the Laplacian of U uh, equals one on the boundary of where U is positive. So if you put all these mathematical equations together, you end up with uh, this concise way of saying that the Laplacian of U as a measure equals the direct mass acting at U. So here you see that it's a, a highly singular equation because a delta of U here appears as a potential. It's not, it's not delta of U, the function delta of U is delta of U, uh, delta naught, the, the direct mass acting at you. So it charges one when you cross uh, the boundary where you is positive. And this problem can be treated variationally <clears throat> just by interpreting the direct mass as the derivative of the has heavy side function. One is led to study these uh, discontinuous type of functional. You are minimizing the gradient of u square plus the characteristic where u is positive. <clears throat> and this has been done by uh, Alton Caffarelli in a, in a very important um, <clears throat> paper in the beginning of the 1980s, where they really launched these uh, minimal surface theory of free boundaries. They prove existence of minimizers. Minimizers are no longer unique in this case, but nonetheless, they do exist. They are harmonic in the set of positivity. They are Lipschitz continuous, and this regularity is optimal. And uh, the free boundary is indeed smooth up to a negligible set. Uh, a ne negligible, negligible set. And, uh, and the normal derivative is, in fact, one in the classical sense in all these regions where the free boundary is a smooth surface. <clears throat> okay, one more example, and then we move on. Uh, phase transitions. This problem that I just presented also has a two-phase uh, version of it, which is very important. So think that you are drinking uh, something. So you have a, a, a glass, you have some water, let's say water, and uh, you have a piece of ice and you plug to inside of the, of the water. And uh, if you see the mathematical equations involved in this exchange of, of heat, uh, you will see that when the temperature is, is negative, it means that you are inside of the ice. So the, the region where the temperature is below zero, uh, you, you are inside of the ice. And then you have a, an elliptic equation that is related to the properties of the ice. So you expect that this ice is made of pure water. So maybe you should think that this equation here is uh, driven by the Laplace, let's say. But when the temperature is positive, then, then you are inside of the, of the liquid that you're drinking. And if this is pure water, 
then this would be again the Laplacian, but maybe you are drinking something slightly more complex, let's say an orange juice. Uh, so you would end up with uh, another elliptical operator, let's say divergence of bij gradient of u being zero. And you also have a flux balance between these two faces. So you have a flux balance, which is the latent heat, is the, is, is, is the, is the energy that the system charges uh, for the ice to melt. So the, the, the system retain a portion of the, the, of the energy of, to allow the, the phase transition. Um, So the regularity in two phase problems, it depends on the flux balance, uh, requires superior uh, code marks here, interior regularity of the running operators. And uh, it relies on a much more delicate analysis, monotonicity formula uh, and or continuity conditions from flux balance. So they are much more sophisticated type of problems, but nonetheless, there is a robust, uh, a regularity theory already available to treat these kind of problems. Okay, so free boundary regularity, uh, they are in, typically they are in two kind of, of problems. They are geometric measure estimates where you prove estimates, sharp estimates of the solution near the free boundary. And this is very, it, this is critical because you wanna show that solutions behave in a particular way uh, close to the free boundary. Uh, uniform positive density of the faces and a house of estimates. Uh, you also have the second set of results. They are related to strong regularity uh, estimates and they rely on blow up classification, a flatness improvement and uh, oscillation control of weak normal vectors. And this is how you pass from from a house of estimates to differentiability of the free boundary. The picture I would like to convey is this. Uh, imagine that you have a free boundary, you have two phases. You would, let's say U is positive in one phase, U is negative in the other phase. Uh, and then you fix a point on the free boundary. Once you prove optimal regularity, regularity of U, what you are saying is you are creating a a barrier which uh, constrains the maximum slope in which you will vanish. And this often comes together with an degeneracy estimate, which is, a, is an estimate of the same degree of the optimal estimate, which gives you a minimal slope. So once you, you have done that, you have created in each point of the free boundary, a cone with precisely the same shape that will drive you to hit the free boundary. So even though you don't know the geometry of the free boundary yet, you know that this, uh, this domain is created by, by a function in which you have a, some rigid control on how uh, you hit the free boundary. So the picture I wanna uh, convey is this one. So you don't quite understand what U does, but you will be trapped between uh, two comparable curves. And once you have that, you are able to obtain these kind of results. Uh, for instance, the, uh, every time that you have a ball centered at the free boundary, uh, a, a chunk of this ball will be in one side and hopefully you want to prove this to the both faces and you have uh, which uh, at this point does imply some uh, geometric constraints on on the free boundary itself for instance the free boundary uh, because of this property the free boundary cannot develop cusps uh, a strong regularity estimate so once you have proven all these kind of things you pass through these uh, properties of showing that the free boundary uh, enjoys some smoothness effect. Uh, 
so the free boundary is differential. It's a differential both surface in, 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 in classical in the classical sense, and and this is in general proven like this. Uh, you you establish a result that says that if the free boundary is flat in in in, a, in, in with respect to particular direction, in the sense that the free boundary uh, can be trapped in a <clears throat> in a layer of let's say with a epsilon, then if you go to the ball of radius one half, maybe maybe in, in, with respect to a slightly tilted uh, direction, the free boundary is even flatter. And if you go to the ball of radius one fourth, it's even flatter and even flatter. So these kind of results, they uh, would imply uh, regularity provided that you are able to control these tilted normal vectors. So if you are able to prove that these tilted normal vectors converge, then as a matter of fact, you are proving that the free boundary is differentiable. And <clears throat> in a way to visual, visualize that, and let me make these pictures, supposing that these tilted normal vectors are constant, is like this. Um, <clears throat> so if you are in the ball of radius one, the free boundary is free to oscillate inside of these big, these big box. But once I go to the ball of radius one half, now the free boundary is trapped to um, oscillate in this smaller ball. And then if I go to the ball of radius one, radius one fourth, the free boundary will have to oscillate inside of this ball of radius, um, uh, uh, this <clears throat> uh, even smaller box and so on and so forth. So now if you join the edges of all those uh, boxes, here is what you see. You will see a C1 alpha curve that will drive the free boundary to pass to that point in a C1 alpha fashion. So if you have a function that, that you don't quite know how it oscillates, but if it's trapped to oscillate, between these two curves, then there is no other option. It, it will have to pass through that point in a C1 alpha fashion. And what I'd like to point out is that those are very powerful geometric insights as how you prove that very complicated objects, namely free boundary uh, regions are, are smooth. And they are extremely powerful tools, uh, which, one can only infer whether they could be applied to solve other problems. And this goes back to, to a more <clears throat> modern uh, idea, which uh, has to do with, has been named a non-physical free boundaries. So the idea is like this, is that if you have an ordinary PE, uh, most of the cases, they carry an, uh, in their innate structure a special regions, which encode the gene of their attributes. So for instance, in the Pilaplacian equation, uh, solutions are real analytic everywhere, but the points where the gradient vanishes, that's why solutions drop their regularity dramatically. <clears throat> And in fact, advancing on such PDEs often depend on critical understanding of those special entities. For instance, if you have a solution to the Pilaplacian equation and you don't, you know, uh, let's say that it doesn't have critical points, then you know that solutions are 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 this move. <clears throat> so, but if you if you look at those problems, those kind of problems like that, uh, and you make a comparison between those kind of, of difficulties with the theory of free boundary problems, you see a pattern, you see a, a relation, even though it's, it, it lies in, in, in the world of ideas, but it's a very, um, it's a very powerful 
connection because in free boundary problems, uh, the free boundary is, is such a region. So everything, you, you, you understand everything, you have a, a, a well-known PDE that governs the solution in the set of no coincidence set, and somehow something happens on the free boundary which drops the regularity of you. So, so what, what, what I'm trying to say here is that maybe this very powerful geometric approach to pre-boundary problems that I just explained to you may somehow provide some insights, new tools and techniques to tackle those problems. Uh, the problems that they don't have a, a, a free boundary per se, but they do have entities or regions that you quite don't understand yet that encodes all the difficulty of the problem that you're trying to study. And uh, those are the, the ones that has been named non-physical free boundaries. So let me give you a few examples. Uh, the first example is these reaction diffusion equations. So you have a U, the, uh, let's say it's a density of a gas in a catalytic, catalytic reaction. So it's a, it's a well-known problem that you have the Laplacian of U equals U to the P. And um, so what happened, this problem is, is important because there is a region where U uh, vanishes identically. And there is a region where U is positive. And this problem, it doesn't have a, a free boundary per se, because you still have a PDE inside of the region where U vanishes. Uh, U vanishes, but it's just because zero is a solution, is a local solution of the ODE itself. Uh, you can apply a soft analysis and say that, let's say if U is bounded, then the Laplacian of U is bounded because the Laplacian of U is U to the P. If U is bounded, U to the P is bounded. So U to the P uh, being bounded, the Laplacian of U is bounded, then U is C1 alpha. If U is C1 alpha, then U to the P is just C alpha. I'm sorry, is C P for the, the, the very same P that you're raising. I think uh, the absolute value is, uh, uh, think let's say T and T to the P is just uh, P Hilder continuous. So Schauder estimates give you that solutions are C2P. So you do have just on the soft analysis that solutions uh, decrease in a quadratic fashion. <clears throat> so yeah, you does uh, hit the, the, the ground in a quadratic fashion and that, that follows from this soft analysis. Now let me suggest a non-physical free boundary approach to this type of problems, where you see these touching ground points as the non-physical free boundary. Again, they are not a free boundary per se, even though they are the set where U vanishes, but they're not a free boundary. You still have a PDE across this region. And here's a theorem that one can prove, and it gets in a much more general fashion. You can prove uh, for a very general nonlinear, uh, fully nonlinear elliptic operator, where the coefficients are not even continuous, therefore solutions are just held their continuous in the set of positivity, but nonetheless, they touch the pre, uh, these non-physical free boundary precisely as a C2 over one minus P uh, function, in the sense that at each point of this touching ground point, you can uh, place a curve that it looks like uh, t to the two divided by one minus p. And this will trap and it will drive you to vanish precisely at that velocity. And the key observation is that this number is always greater than two plus p, which comes from the soft analysis. So somehow using the insights from free boundary problems, you can improve uh, the estimate, and of course, as p goes to one, two divided by one minus p goes to infinity. So for instance, if p is, let's say one half, if p is one half, 
So instead of getting uh, uh, a regularity of order two plus one half, you are getting a regularity of order C4. So it's a much, much higher regularity estimate on those points. So the picture, it, it looks like that. You don't quite understand what you does in the set of, of positivity in, in the theorem that I just presented solutions could be just Hilder continuous because you have a, a known smooth coefficients, but nonetheless, it hits the free boundary in a very precise fashion, in a very smooth fashion. <clears throat> okay, so let's now explain another problem which has to do with the CP prime regularity conjecture. And um, so it's been known as a consequence of the George Nash uh, Moser theory that solutions to <coughs> the Piloplacian of U being a uh, L infinite function is always of, of, of class C, C1 alpha for some alpha that depends on P and uh, eventually dimension. And uh, we don't know this alpha, but we can make a uh, educated guess. You look at the radial uh, example, if you compute the Pilaplacian of uh, the absolute value of x to the power p divided by p minus one, this is constant. It's a very simple uh, calculation. And this sets the conjecture. Solutions should be, so one should hope, it's a very bold conjecture, but one should hope that solutions, any solution uh, is of order C1, one over p plus one. And this is precise, if you add these two numbers, p divided by p minus one is precisely the, the conjugate of p. So it gives this natural charm for, for the conjecture. And this has been proven to be true uh, in 2D. So if you are, if the function depends only on two variables, this conjecture has been proven true. It is true that all solutions in, the, in 2D, all functions whose Pilaplacian is bounded is precisely CP prime. So what happens in higher dimension? This is a major problem. It's one of the, I would say, that's one of the most uh, interesting, from my perspective, problems in, in the nonlinear theory of diffusion is what happens in higher dimensions. Is the CP prime regularity conjecture still true in higher dimensions? But here's an analysis that one can do. Uh, you know that if the gradient of U is positive, then solutions are C1, 1 minus, in the sense that it's C1 alpha for every alpha less than one. And this comes from soft analysis because in the region where you, uh, the gradient is positive, then it's gonna be positive in a region be because of continuity, solutions are C1 alpha, we know that. Um, so in, 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 a, in a region where the gradient is, the absolute value of the gradient is positive, in a non-critical point, solutions are C1 alpha for a very high alpha, any alpha that you want less than one, solutions are of that form. Um, the non-physical free boundary, so what uh, plays the role of free boundary in this problem is of course the points, the critical points, which are points that depend on the solution itself. So <clears throat> if, if for instance, um, the critical point is a local extrema in the sense that it's a local max or a local mean, then somehow, somehow this problem looks like a one phase free boundary. And the advantage of that, making this parallel between two uh, free boundary theory and this non-physical free boundary theory is that it's easier to prove optimal regularity for one phase free boundary points than it's for two phase free boundary points as I pointed out before. Um, so in fact, this has been proven true. If you have a function whose Pilaplacian is, is bounded and you are, let's say Z naught is an, a local extremum, then as a matter of fact, solutions are CP prime at that point. And furthermore, if uh, you, you can even prove a, 
a very restrict result if, uh, if the absolute value of f is greater than or equal to some c naught, then in fact, it's precisely CP prime as happens in the free boundary regular P theory. So geometric, the, the picture that I want you to keep in mind is this. If you, if you are in a local extremum for a, a function that satisfies the Pilaplosian of you being bounded, then somehow you are putting two comparable curves and you will have to go to that point trapped between these two comparable curves. So it's a very restricted geometric interpretation of regularity that gives you an insight on how these uh, theorems, uh, what, kind, what kind of geometry one should expect for you on those points where diffusion um, degenerates. <clears throat> okay, finally, let's go back to shoulder estimates and try to see if we can uh, obtain a free boundary perspective for those, uh, for those estimates. So it turns out that in the variational theory, the non-physical free boundary is the set of critical points. And uh, in the non-variational theory, the non-physical free boundary is the set where the Haitian degenerates. And as a matter of fact, one can obtain a much higher, much more precise shoulder a priori estimates. Uh, and for that, you just need ellipticity and, and a mild continuity condition on the coefficients. So if you have, for instance, in divergence form equation, if you have divergence of AIJ of X greater than U being zero, and you are in a point where the gradient is zero, then solutions vanish at that point um, as a C11 minus function. So, so even though solutions are just C1, they're just differentiable somehow in all other points. If you are in a point where the gradient is zero, then then you have a much more, much more precise information, much higher uh, regularity estimate for that point. So just to exemplify this, imagine that you have a, a distributional solution to divergence of AIJ gradient of U equals zero. And let's say that AIJ is here that continues for a very small alpha. Then Shoulder yields this estimate. Gradient is C1 over 1,000. I'm sorry, it's, uh, yeah, solutions are C1, 1 over 1,000 everywhere, everywhere. However, if you are in a critical point, then the solution is much better. It could be uh, C1, uh, 999 divided by 1000. And geometrically, this is the picture that I would like you to keep in mind. Uh, if you are proving that a function is held or continuous, uh, basically you have this uh, spherical kind of shape in which uh, the function is uh, restricted to oscillate. But because they are spherical, it's not a very restricted uh, condition. So the function can oscillate a lot. And this is what Shoulder estimate proves. <clears throat> However, if you are in a critical point, in a critical point, you can improve this spherical shape to a cone-like shape like this. And this is what happens. Um, you are restricting much, much more the function to oscillate. The, the, the oscillation happens in a much more restricted region. And that's, that's why this estimate is much better. Okay, so with that, I, I conclude my talk and I'd like to just take a minute with a, uh, an advertisement. So next time that you, you have a, a quality PD paper, please do consider submitting it for uh, this new journal uh, launched by Springer Nature. And, uh, and with that, I stop and, and here I think it's a good, place for me to stop and I, I thank for your attention.